Welcome to Office Hours for the 12th of March, 2024. Today, we'll have a, a round table. Uh, what have you been doing? What do you plan to do next? Do you have any roadblocks and do you need any resources? And I'll go hello. ahead. Oh, hello there. Good morning. I'll go ahead and start start off. Um, so I have some, some updates for the space frequency block coding in Simulink that goes into HDL coder, which becomes a, um, a HDL design that we publish. And so we have a working model-based design in Simulink. Yes, uh, it can be processed by the HDL coder toolbox. I ran this custom function through the HDL coder yesterday, no errors. And it's not yet published as an open source HDL because the rest of the design uh, over on Neptune is, uh, is not yet ready for a draft to publish. And so when we talk about space frequency block coding, this is a variant of space time block coding. And this is a transmit diversity technique, which makes your signal more resilient in a multi-path environment, which we have in microwave. And we expect uh, on, on drones and, and some other uses of, of Neptune. So here is a, it's, this is gonna be a set of diagrams. It's gonna show the difference between space time block coding and the variant that we call space frequency block coding. So here we have our two transmit antennas and you can see our OFDM subcarriers. And what we do is we take our transmit sample stream and we manipulate it. So we are going to, instead of transmitting one stream of samples from one antenna, we're gonna take this stream of samples and we're going to change it. We're going to transmit the these samples uh, from two antennas. So if we have two different antennas and a, and a stream of samples, that means we sort of get an extra time slot. So it's a two by two instead of a one by one. So you can see we take our sample uh, one and assign that to antenna one. We take our sample two, we assign it to antenna two, and that's transmitted in the, the first time step. The second time step, we swap the places of these samples and we transform them a negative complex conjugate and a conjugate and the conjugate is the asterisk and the negative sign means negative conjugate conjugate so with this we're going to get code separation and frequency separation and space separation all at the kind of the same time now time is going down in this diagram now this is good uh, it does make the receiver more complicated but there's there's known good techniques and in a multi-path environment this is worth it so what happens on the on the next round you know because we're taking these two samples at a time um, sort of conceptually so so now we have our subcarriers which are, are essentially our time steps we're going further in time we, we're showing what happens with uh, sample three and sample four and that we do that same transformation, swap places, and transmit them out from antenna one and antenna two. Okay, so over on the receive antenna, here's what happens. We have uh, one antenna, and then time is going down. So the first subcarrier arrives, we have these two, sub second subcarrier arrives, we have these two, and so on, and so on. And the goal for this set of diagrams is to actually show the math and what we, we do here. It's really quite clever. For space frequency block coding, we do something different. Um, we transmit our sample stream on antenna one. So instead of swapping places like we did before, see on antenna one, we have S1 and then we have negative S2 conjugate. So instead of doing that, we're actually going to, to go ahead and, and transmit S1, S2, S3, S4 on antenna one, and we transmit our our modified signals, our modified samples, sorry, on antenna two. Okay, so so that's the difference. Now our code separation or the ortho orthogonality of the signals um, is going to be from antenna one to antenna two. And here's how it looks as it as it goes further on in time. And then the set of diagrams eventually will also include the um, the receive side and how you process that and how you do the math. So what does this look like in in code? So what I decided to do 
was to take the uh, MATLAB function that was in the book, um, Understanding LTE with MATLAB, and simplify it uh, because that particular function handles both the two, two transmit antenna and the four transmit antenna cases. And we have a, a two transmit antenna design. So I just lifted that part out uh, and then attempted to, to go ahead and just write it in as a MATLAB function. And then in Simulink, you can take your MATLAB function and you can put it inside of a block. So you have a custom block with a custom function. The arguments to the function and the output of the function form the ports on the block and you just connect it up. So there was an interesting bug that I found and, and it threw up its hands and said, complex conjugation is not defined for this class. So I had to go back and, and fix it. Um, what, what was required was to make absolutely sure that the type of the um, of our variables handling the, the signals that are coming in now the block uh, was the right type. So even though it looked like it was the right type, uh, some, some work had to be done. This was the main bug that we had to resolve. Um, and so I'm going to say that this is in the, in the design, it's in the model, but it has not been verified yet. So what we like to do is to make absolutely sure that, a, that it's working. Um, I, I looked at it as, the, as a standalone function manually fed in uh, complex pairs that st stood for samples. It worked like it was expected. Uh, what we're going to have to do is is in the model uh, verify this with more more data and make sure that that it is actually working. On the on over on opulent voice, we've had uh, some some big steps forward on synchronization. So there's a basic bandpass filter design. Uh, this is a synchronization uh, technique in order to to get carrier synchronization to extract a clock uh, for for being able to uh, integrate the the power from the the down converted samples. Um, you have to have to be able to get those things in order to to successfully do it for minimum shift keying. The bandpass filter design is now producing a clock signal of sorts. It looks a little hairy. Uh, the next round of design will be uh, numerically controlled oscillators and phase lock loop based. And there's been a lot of uh, understanding from several papers recommended by Matthew Wishick. So thank you to him for, for helping us out there and for uh, giving good advice. Uh, so this work is over on the Opulent Voice channel. The resolution of questions about the sample and hold blocks being inside of a resettable subsystem, go, got that. So those sample and hold blocks, you can't put a sample and hold inside of a resettable subsystem to get a resettable sample and hold. You can, um, but it won't work. It, it's, it's definitely incompatible with HTL coder. You get an error once you get that far. This resolves a question that has hang, been hanging around for about a month. Um, so we'll be writing our own function to do this. And there's at least two people that are looking at doing this and we'll we'll get that written, we'll get it in a block and then we'll replace the blocks that basically are one shots. <laughs> so it's, so if you, wanna, if you wanna sample and hold, you could get it. Uh, but if you need it to be reset in hardware, then it doesn't quite work. I'm not sure why. Um, and like I pointed out on Slack, the, this is a good, example of like when you're dealing with proprietary tools and they don't work the way that you expect there's not much you can do except complain uh, and me and other people over time at look back there's been several years worth of people asking why the heck doesn't a resettable sample and hold work this is a function that that uh, is useful and there's there hasn't been any it's odd because it's, it's like nobody from MathWorks just says oh yeah this isn't compatible it's not in their documentation you just have to kind of like get far enough in your design to get HDL coder to return the error. That error message is very clear. So that's resolved and we'll we'll go with the custom function. Kind of like how we did with the um the the space frequency block coding. All right, and that's it. I'll go back up here to the start and um I'll go ahead, Paul, uh if, let us know how it's how it's going and and uh what is there's anything that remote labs needs? Hello, I have uh, nothing to add this week. Remote labs are cooking away, working as usual. Yeah, thank you for the help. And also, 
uh, I think that we had to battle a little bit of uh, cut and paste not working between host and target. Uh, I think that was my my only complaint. I did not make any progress on figuring that out. Um, it's related to, but not directly connected to the problem that uh, involved the X server permissions. But I don't think that that's the solution to this. Okay. Yeah, there's plenty of ways around it. It was just really nice as long as it was working. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for all of your help and support. All right. And, and Matthew, you have the floor. Okay. Um, I was hoping this last week I'd be able to look more at the um, issue for the, uh, that Ken's been working on. Um, but I just, I hadn't been able to get to it. I, I took a peek at it last night, but I still need to set up and see if I can run the script uh, to get to the error. Um, but we did have some discussion uh, after the call last week, and I, I think he has some ideas about how to uh, move forward on that now. But I'll keep looking at it, and you know, until as well until uh, that gets resolved. And um, so this was the uh, integration for the um, the uh, channelized filter bank, um, where he was having an issue with the. Uh, Connecting it up to the XI bus and the and the FIFAs, I believe, uh, in the using the ADI scripts. Correct. Yeah, he'll be uh, looking forward to to any uh, any help you have uh, to give. He's made a, a progress on uh, you know reading up on on for more documentation from ADI that he found. Uh, he has an appointment today, so so he'll uh, he'll be in later, and I'll I'll let him know. But thank you. That's uh a big deal once we get that cleared up then that's going to clear that's going to make it at least the procedure much more clear for all of the other blocks that will be coming in on the design so so once we figure out how to graft things in and how to properly uh, integrate then um, things get a lot more interesting pretty quickly so that, that's preamble work or that's a yeah polyphase filter bank work right and then um I, that's pretty much it. I, I haven't really, I just been uh, kind of following along what you've been doing with the synchronization stuff and, you know, offering any help as that's been going along, but um, that's been kind of quiet this week. Um, so that, that was it. Yeah. Thank you very much for the help. I think that was a big step forward. Um, so yeah, I'll be, I'll be traveling for, for IEEE and for FCC uh, starting late this week. So, so I'll be out for a bit, uh, but we'll, I'll I'll do all that I can, and um, I'll be back as soon as soon as possible. Let's see. Oh yeah, the uh, data stores have been. This is for preambles on over on Neptune, but this also applies to Opulent Voice because we also have uh, you know pre sort of pre-calculated or 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 known in advance uh, preambles and postambles, um, and the data store approach, which works. Um, that was a, a big step forward for learning uh, how to use things like Simulink. The, so they have a data store uh, sort of memory model, but that is not compatible with HDL coder. So HDL coder does not turn that into HDL. However, HDL coder will turn a, a basic RAM or a random access memory into into HDL coder. And that that seems to be the, the design pattern that is supposed to work for for these sorts of situations. So what I did is I swapped out the data store approach and I put in RAM. Uh, now this broke everything because the RAMs are not initialized with anything. They don't have anything in them, but HDL coder worked. So it said, oh yes, I see that you have a RAM of a particular address size. The counter is connected up to the uh, the address line that everything worked. Uh, and the process for initializing the RAM is in Simulink at least is before the there, there's a set of functions you can designate as like pre-initialization. And those are things that run before the model starts starts running. So at least to get the model working and you know to kind of mimic actual hardware, um, you know, so there's RAMs that hold the data for the preambles. These have to be initialized with something on power up in your hardware. Uh, there is no ROM for for HDL coder, but I did find a 
a pretty extensive example of like here's how you do a ROM uh, in 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 hardware. Uh, but when we look at an FPGA, we don't really have that. So it's all I think it's all RAM. Uh, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but the next next step in order to get HDL coder to produce something that we can actually run will be um, you know these those little bits of RAM. And then we'll just have to make sure that those are initialized correctly with the values from the preambles. So that that happened, and I it was I, it was uh, I got further than I thought I did. So oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that the FPGAs don't have ROM per se, but they you know you can implement lookup tables just in in the LUTs, so you can effectively create a ROM or lookup tables within the FPGAs. Um, so they don't they don't have to be RAMs with initialization. Um, you know, it kind of depends on on the needs of the project. Like you might want to use the uh, uh, LUT based ROMs if you have enough, you know, plenty of space. But if you're low on resources, they're actually kind of nice to be able to put them in the RAMs if they're if you have block RAMs available, because then that doesn't take up the um, the LUT resources in the FPGA. So, but you 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 can effectively implement uh, ROMs on FPGAs, but it uses the distributed LUTs to do so. Okay, yeah, I think that's. That's a really good point, and it makes sense to me. It seems like we're totally thick with BRAM, but that's because we have this really large development board. And I think over time, we would want to look at at a much smaller part, you know, for, for production or for prototyping. So I'm going to just keep that in mind, and I'll get the RAM thing working first, and then and then we can start looking at at an alternate that we can have in the model as a switch, like switch back and forth between them or have it have them both in parallel and yeah that, uh, just in I'd case say that's one thing would be really nice you know for this type of of thing is if you can make it parameterizable mm -hmm. uh, especially like in the in the rtl or the h you know the hdl code which you know where i'm i live you know i like to you know you could instantiate one or the other to paste on the on you know the needs of the project um yes Okay, that's. Uh, I think that's a good approach, and I'll I'll do my best, and and I'll I'll trust that you'll point me in the right direction if it if it seems to be uh, falling off the table. <laughs> but yeah, I got it got it written down. That's halfway to halfway to getting it done. Okay, all right. Anything else, Matthew? Uh no, no. I was just uh, to comment on the ROMs. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, so we submitted a Zadoff Chu article. The Zadoff Chu sequence is largely replaced uh, Walsh codes for for synchronization and for uh, uh, you know just essentially here, hey, here's my signal and and uh, correlation functions. Um, and it, it, the the article reviews so far uh, are sparse uh, because for, for the submitted it to QEX, um, not a whole lot of digital design reviewers. So mostly confusion so far, but it didn't get rejected, hasn't been rejected yet. So we may be asked to do some sort of uh, revision, uh, but it'd be nice to get it, get that published. Um, I think a draft already went out to the list and we'll, we'll, we'll see. So uh, the any feedback is great and will be used to improve it. Um, uh, for space frequency block coding, I've got a write up uh, with the with the diagrams from today, uh, those are in progress, but they're they're getting there since we we had a breakthrough in in understanding the difference and exactly what the frequency and space frequency block code means. Um, there was there's been a lot of questions over the past week about from the FlexLink uh, revision and uh, a couple of meetings where it was like Q and A. Uh, and I have a lot of questions about the the revisions, and there there is some some information that was in the previous revision, revision eleven, that's not in the the latest one. Uh, so I'm I'm hoping to see that in the future. That'd be nice to to see it come back and and get explained. Um, that FlexLink specification looks it it's gone from a standalone specification style uh, to a chapter in a larger book. And it looks like a textbook, so there's a a lot of implementation details and an explanation and reference uh, designs. So I think it's probably a good idea to wait until that's 
finished. There's a lot of things that aren't done yet. So we'll, we'll wait and see. We'll keep working on the things that, that are OFDM and LTE inspired specific that like, yes, we're going to need to do this. Everything will be parameterized. Um, and so, so a couple of us started a, a, a slightly simplified specification for Neptune. Um, and we also wanted to kind of explore a larger subcarrier spacing that was uh, closer to, to what you might find for six gig or five gig since we're, since we're in, you know, the five gigahertz uh, amateur band, um, the 15 or 20 uh, kilohertz subcarrier spacing doesn't, it, it won't give you all the performance that you can get with that frequency band. So, so we'll, we'll keep working and, and do all of the functions that, that are going to be needed regardless, whether it's a flex link or a simplified specification. And there's been some, some good uh, R and D kind of reading uh, from the, the vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to everything sort of 5G, 6G community. So there's an awful lot there and it's really pretty neat. So that'll continue and we'll just, uh, we'll just produce the parts of the design that are that are common, you know, the to to add pretty much any OFDM sort of LTE based approach, parameterize everything, and then we should our design should be able to handle um, future revisions of the specification. And that's it on my list. All right, any anybody else have any questions or things they they want to see happen or anything fun going on? All right, I'll be at uh, IEEE OpCom coming up here at the end of the week. And then right after that, I'll fly to, to DC for the kickoff uh, for the FCC Technological Advisory Council meeting. And I'll know a whole lot more after that. They're going to introduce the three sub working, gr working groups. And uh, at, that's where we talk about sub working groups. So, how to break down the mandates for the working groups. And um, this this go around, so this is a, a roughly two year term. This this go around will definitely have a six G working group. We'll definitely have a dynamic spectrum allocation working group, which has a lot of of uh, a lot of industry participation in it, and also has a lot of a uh, lot of discussion about things like AIML for figuring out the, how to balance. Uh, spectrum allocation. And then there is a working group for, for artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, itself. So those are the, the three working groups uh, this year. Now, the, the, there is always the option for proposing um, sub-working group categories of, of, you know, of, of investigation that, you know, that in whichever one it kind of falls under the most is, is where it usually ends up. Uh, and it's not outside the realm of possibility to propose a, a, a working group. Um, it might might be a little bit late for this term, but that's that's in the past. That's been a something that's been raised to uh, to approach uh, the FCC about. So if there's some sort of regulatory thing that we think we might want to dig into, we have a, a we do have a short list that we've discussed on the on the list and on Slack. Um, then now is a really good time to to start. Start thinking about uh, communicating that to to the folks on TAC. It's a very good experience. This is a, a great group with lots of. Uh, it's mostly industry. I think we are one of the very few uh, non-commercial participants. The ARRL is also represented uh, by Mr. Lapine, um, and and I've encouraged uh, some of the other open source tech tech groups to to also participate. And they've also they've been speakers in the past. And we'll be going back around and and uh, touching base with them uh, over the next two years. So that's, uh, I think we'll, we'll probably the meetings will be catch as can, but we'll we'll resume uh, late in March. And that's all I've got. All right, thanks everybody. I'll see you on Slack and uh, looking forward to to getting this stuff on the air. <laughs>